Uh, Ariel Girard is a second year medical student. She sat where you're sitting now last year. Uh, Ariel is working on a distinction in adv advocacy. She's very interested in liberalizing New York's medical cannabis statute. So Ariel is going to take the yes in 12 minutes. I'll interrupt her, and then I'll take 15 minutes and answer no. All right. Student Dr. Gerard. Just hold it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so I'm on the side saying that yes, we should be liberalizing the new uh, medical cannabis statute in New York. So the points I'll be covering are that the safety profile of cannabis allows for low risk experimentation, especially when other therapies have failed or have unfavorable side effects. Faster implementation of the statute is necessary. Smoking is a viable delivery system and should remain an option, although it should be used only when necessary. Availability of the raw plant is beneficial in terms of cost and possibly safety. Conditions which will be eligible are unnecessarily restricted and limit physician autonomy. Access needs to be expanded and home grows will decrease costs and are eco-friendly. So in order to understand why the New York law is too restrictive, a basic understanding of cannabis and cannabinoid medicine is essential. Cannabinoid medicine can be delivered in raw whole plant form or in synthetic isolated formulations. It has various potential benefits, some of which have been demonstrated in clinical trials and animal studies, others with hundreds of anecdotal reports. These potential benefits include assisting in decreasing nausea, vomiting and pain, especially neuropathic, decreasing spasticity, tremor, rigidity, seizures, increasing appetite, decreasing sleep disturbance, anti-anxiety properties, and producing short-term reduction of intraocular eye pressure, reducing inflammation, decreasing symptoms of PTSD, and more. Treatment of these symptoms is beneficial for patients with HIV, AIDS, multiple sclerosis, cancer, movement disorders, certain gastrointestinal disorders, and more. It has demonstrated an ability to act as an anti-tumor agent, may be useful in treating neurodegenerative disorders like Huntington's and Parkinson's, and is potentially useful as an additional therapy and treatment of certain mental health disorders. It may also be helpful in reducing opiate addiction. Cannabinoid medicine has the potential to both control symptoms and directly treat conditions. There are, sorry, <laughs> there are over 400 compounds in the cannabis plant, approximately 80 of which are unique to it and are known as cannabinoids. Cannabinoids bind to CB1 and CB2 uh, G protein coupled receptors, which are found throughout the body. And they work within the endocannabinoid system, which is involved in regulation of mood, sleep, appetite, pain sensation, memory, movement, synaptic plasticity, and more. The body's endogenous cannabinoids are anandamide and 2-AG and use these same receptors. Cannabis is currently inappropriately classified as a Schedule I controlled substance, with a definition that it has no accepted medical use in the U.S., a lack of accepted safety under medical supervision, and a high potential for abuse. Cannabis is, um, is reported to be the most difficult substance to study in the U.S. and is therefore infrequently studied here, but is studied more in other nations. Dronabinol or Marinol is an FDA-approved cannabinoid medication made of only synthetic isolated tetra, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, also known as THC, which is the psychoactive cannabinoid in cannabis. It is a Schedule III controlled substance and is used to treat chemotherapy-related nausea as well as to stimulate appetite. While beneficial for certain applications, it has many limitations and is not useful for, conditions which could, for all conditions which could be benefited by cannabinoid medicine, such as those for which THC is not the most efficacious cannabinoid agent. For example, some patients experience an intensely negative psychoactive experience while using dronabinol due to the absence of other cannabinoids, which may dull the impact of THC's effects. Additionally, other cannabinoids found in cannabis, notably cannabidiol, abbreviated as CBD, produce many of its health benefits. The various compounds found in cannabis are thought to act synergistically, and this has been termed the entourage effect. Isolated cannabinoids may not produce the same benefits as a combination of cannabinoids and compounds, and varying cannabinoid ratios causes different effects. For example, the low THC, high CBD strain can be used to reduce seizures in patients with epileptic conditions, but does not induce the known high from intoxication. While most people think of smoking when they hear marijuana, there are multiple effective delivery methods. Inhalation methods include smoking and vaporization. And vaporization occurs when the plant is heated at lower temperatures than those that induce burning. So the cannabinoids are released in the vapor from the plant's trichomes and fewer carcinogenic 
um, compounds are released in comparison to smoking. Ingestion methods include oral mucosal sprays like Sativex, which is a branded whole plant medicine that's legal in other countries, as well as capsules, oils, tinctures, and edibles. One of the most important things to note about cannabis's utility in medicine is its highly favorable safety profile. It is virtually impossible to die as a result of an accidental overdose of cannabis, unlike many other commonly prescribed medications like opiates. There is no strong or definitive evidence to support the fact that low to moderate smoked cannabis use results in an increased risk of cancer or a decrease in pulmonary function. There is no causative evidence to support the assertion that cannabis causes mental disorders. However, it may exacerbate certain disorders, which is a reason that knowledge of the patient's physical and mental health history and medical supervision of use is important. Chronic long-term users of smoked cannabis may demonstrate minor deficits in certain cognitive tasks, such as reaction time after many years of heavy use, and some evidence has shown that brainwave patterns of chronic long-term users are altered in comparison to their non-smoking counterparts. But it is unclear whether these differences always reflect dysfunction in, as opposed to modified function or are clinically significant. Other studies have found no cognitive deficits with cannabis use. If use begins in adulthood, there is no evidence for risk of brain atrophy with use. Some users of cannabis do become dependent psychologically or physiologically. One can become psychologically dependent on almost anything, and the tolerance and withdrawal symptoms which characterize the physical dependence are minimal. Additionally, cannabis is less physiologically addictive than nicotine, alcohol, and caffeine. Serious side effects are rare and largely reversible with abstinence. Those using medical cannabis with psychoactive levels of THC may temporarily experience negative emotions or sensations, which are in almost all cases an issue of perceived rather than actual harm. Since much of the data we have on long-term cannabis use was gathered from participants using smoking as a delivery method, it is unclear whether the potential negative side effects of cannabis use are due to the effects of the plant's pharmacologic properties or to the inhalation of burnt plant material of any kind. Additionally, possible detriments of cannabis use must be compared equivalently to the detriments of other medications in order to provide an accurate contextual framework, and objective risk-benefit analysis is essential. Long story short, all medications have side effects. Those caused by cannabis use are very minimal, and there is therefore a low risk for experimentation by patients under medical supervision. And on to the statute. Patients will need to wait a minimum of 18 months for this program to begin. However, given the amount of information we have on cannabis' safety, the expertise that exists on cannabis growth and regulation in this country, and the fact that growing most cannabis plants takes only three to seven months, making patients wait this long is unnecessary. Preliminary data on a trial of the high CBD, low THC oil shows marked improvements in seizure reduction for patients with treatment-resistant epilepsy. It is currently available in Colorado and can be grown in New York beginning immediately. As a result of delayed access, Anna Conti, a nine-year-old girl with Dravet syndrome who helped her family advocate for the New York bill, passed away in July as a result of a major seizure after the bill was passed without the option to see whether or not medical cannabis would work for her. Interstate delivery is possible, but technically illegal, although some producers are willing to take the risk. Other patients in the state currently using and experiencing benefit from cannabis will continue to do so illegally, with risks of procurement from the underground market involved. Cannabis purchased through the underground market may contain pesticides and fungus that is dangerous for people to inhale or ingest, especially those who are already ill. And contact with the underground market can also be dangerous for other reasons. Faster access um, will help to keep patients safe. The current statute does not allow cannabis to be smoked. The benefits of inhalation methods are fast delivery, which impor is important in order to treat symptoms like pain and spasticity before they become larger problems. And it is easy for patients who have dynamic presentation of symptoms to self-titrate because they feel the effect so quickly and can moderate their use based on how they feel within minutes. As mentioned, there is no evidence for an in increased risk of decreased pulmonary function as a result of smoked cannabis use at low to moderate frequency. And there is no strong evidence that use of smoked cannabis leads to an increased risk for cancer, unlike tobacco cigarettes. Due to the dangers inherent in smoking any type of burnt plant material, vaporization is a better option. However, cost of vaporization devices can be prohibitive, with the most efficient devices costing upwards of $700. Smoking should be used minimally and only when necessary, but it is important that it remain an option for patients and their healthcare providers. There will be no availability to the raw plant according to the statute. Therefore, only concentrates will be able to be ingested or vaporized. Formulation of concentrates will significantly increase the cost of the medications and will limit the number of people who can benefit from its use, especially because insurance companies cannot cover cannabinoid medications ex except for the currently legal dronabinol. Additionally, we know little about the safety of vaporizing concentrates, while we already know that low to moderate use of smoked cannabis is low risk. 
The conditions for which cannabis may be used according to the statute is severely and unnecessarily limited. The decision of condition to be treated should be made by the physician. If we can trust physicians to prescribe medications off-label, that is for uses for which they have not been FDA approved, we should trust them to use discretion in recommending use of cannabis for patients who may benefit, especially those with debilitating symptoms which cannot be controlled with other medications. Physicians should take an evidence-based approach. However, sometimes the data is not yet available, and we do not have a great deal of in and we do have a great deal of information on the safety profile, which allows for low-risk experimentation for patients in need when necessary, as mentioned. Additionally, patient self-report should not be relied on as fact, but should be taken into account, especially given that objective measures are often not used by physicians engaging real-world patient progress in terms of symptoms like pain and spasticity. Subjective accounts, that is, the patient's own idea of their improvement, is what is used in assessment. And rightfully so in many cases, given that our objective measures of improvement are sometimes not reliable or valid, and quality of life is a, is a subjective measure inherently. According to the current statute, only five grow sites and 20 dispensaries will be allowed in the state, which will result in insufficient access for patients. On average, this allows for only one grow site for every nearly 10,000 miles, one dispensary for every nearly 2,400 miles, maybe more in upstate regions, and one dispensary for every one million residents. It is difficult for ill patients and 24-7 caregivers to travel this distance. Due to the fact that cannabis will not be available in pharmacies due to its lack of FDA approval and its Schedule One classification, the medication must be made available at dispensaries and more will be needed for optimal access. The New York statute will not allow for patients to grow their own plants. Pharmaceutical formulation takes a heavy toll on the environment and the use of home growth can limit this impact. Additionally, and importantly, growing the plant will result in decreased cost to patients. According to an estimate from the federal government's production of medical cannabis in 1978 with inflation taken into account, it only costs approximately $1.14 to grow an ounce of cannabis. And that's a lot because patients only use about 1.5 to 3 grams if smoking or vaporizing every day and there are 28 grams in an ounce. Um, so the concentrate only bill will significantly increase costs of the medication as a result of security, large growth site operations, labor agreements, regulation, formulation, distribution, etc. So New York's medical cannabis statute is a good start, but modifications need to be made in order to optimally help the greatest number of patients who could benefit from its use. The current version will unnecessarily limit modes of delivery and conditions, increase costs, and decrease ease of access. While more research is beneficial and certainly needed, there is ample evidence that cannabis has a low risk of dependence, a low side effect profile even when smoked at low to moderate frequency, and efficacy for certain conditions and symptoms. Therefore, it is a safe, low risk treatment option and should be made available to patients, although it is not yet FDA approved. The method of delivery and condition for which authorization is given should be the decision of the physician. On a larger scale, cannabis needs to be reclassified and research restrictions need to be significantly reduced in order to allow for an increase in both governmental and non-governmental research into both the positive and negative aspects of medical cannabis use. And if you guys want to, there's some further reading here about the, um, the clinical evidence that we have on medical cannabis and then just some other information if you're interested in looking at the New York Times recent series on cannabis and everything. That's it.